All right, have your books open if you would at page 397. And uh, you did questions 1, 2, 4, and 5 on pages 397 to 398. Uh, again, skipping over a couple of chapters. Interesting stuff in those chapters, just stuff we're going to have to um, gloss past for the sake of getting to circuits. And uh, question number one says, what is the typical drift velocity of an electron in a current, and why is this much slower than an electron's actual speed? Michael? The typical drift velocity of an electron in a current is 0 0.02 centimeters per second. It is slower because electrons are continually bumping into one another and stopping. All right, number two, how is resistance defined and what is the unit of resistance, Kendall? Resistance is defined as the voltage requirement to produce an electron in the unit resistance. Very good. Uh, number four, how does resistance vary with length and cross-sectional area, Audrey? Um, resistance varies with length and cross-sectional area because it is directly proportional to its length and inversely Good, so maybe a better way to phrase that, it varies directly with length and inversely with cross-sectional area. Uh, but you've got it in there, good. Number five, write the equation for resistivity and what are its units, Michael? The equation for resistivity is P equals... Rho, that's... Rho, rho yeah. Rho equals A over L times R. Its units are uh, rho times ohms times centimeters. Rho equals ohms times centimeters? I have a uh, rho times... Uh, rho, e, rho is, the resistivity is in the unit, rho, uh, ohms at times centimeters. All right. Uh, if you would, uh, go and turn back to the beginning of this chapter, uh, page 379. So we begin talking about electrical circuits. Uh, one of the things that we did not cover in chapter 23, of course, we skipped over the discussion of magnetism. And uh, magnetism relates to electricity in that magnets can produce an electric current. Remember we said current is simply a flow of? Electricity. Current is defined as the flow of? Electrons. Charge, electrical charge. And we said in a solid, which is what our usual circuits are made of, um, the, uh, the solid, ca is ca the current is carried through what class? Uh, delocalized electrons. Delocalized electrons. Substances with lots of delocalized electrons allow current to move. So the movement, literally the movement of electrons, delocalized electrons, is current. And a magnet can cause electrons to move. Uh, one of the things you might have looked at when you were in physical science was Faraday's experiment, where he simply took a coil of wire and dropping a magnet through, or moving a magnet very quickly through the coil of wire, caused electric current to flow. Okay, not something we have time to do in this class, but something I believe you remember from physical science? Yes, no? So magnetism can induce, because the magnetic charge, so to speak, the polarity pushes the electrons in opposite or in different directions, causing charge to flow. We also skipped over chapter 24, which talks about AC generators. Okay, AC generator, you might remember, it basically uses this principle of a magnet. And the magnetism causes a uh, metal armature, a copper armature, to oscillate back and forth. As it spins, it sends electrons back and forth, alternating back and forth through a circuit. As electrons move, you get current. Current is that flow of charge. So the first thing you need to know is there are actually two types of, well, first, sorry, first thing is to note this term circuit. From the previous chapter, which again, the reason we covered those initial sections was to kind of lay the groundwork here, we know that current is a flow of charge. A circuit is simply a pathway for current. A circuit is simply a pathway for current. A pathway for current. And we would say there's two types of circuits based on what is causing the electrons to move. We have AC circuits, which stands for alternating current. AC circuits, AC stands for alternating current. For our purposes, practically speaking, AC circuits are those circuits which um, uh, are run off of anything that plugs into the wall. So when you think AC, think it plugs into the wall because way back, long way away, are powerful generators that generate a whole lot of current. And uh, so they send the current to the wall outlets um, interesting thing to note, here in the United States, voltage obviously is, is pushing current along, we'll get to that in a minute, but in the United States we have 120 um, volts 
pushing our current, right? So we have 120 volts when you plug something into the wall. If you go over to Europe, though, things run off of 110 volts. It's a little bit different. Um, also, the, uh, we talked about the alternating current, the uh, back and forth movement of the electrons back and forth in opposite directions. Well, it goes at a, at a rate of, in the United States, 60 oscillations per second. Technically, if you could take a really, really slow-mo camera, right, to really slow this down, and you were to record like just a basic incandescent light bulb, and you could really slow it down, you'd see the light flickering constantly. It just flickers 60 times in a second as the electrons go back and forth, and so it looks like continuous light to our eyes. But that alternating current side cycles at 60 cycles per second, or 60 hertz, here in the United States. Overseas, it's 50 hertz. So if you've ever heard of people having problems with their electronic devices overseas, trip to Europe, zap fried my laptop, or overseas. You want to make sure before you travel overseas you get the proper adapters to uh, make it safe for you to use your devices, because here in the US we do things a little differently. Why? Because it's how we did it when we came up with it, and even though the rest of the world does it differently, we don't care. We like the way we do it. Besides, it's really expensive to redo all of our wiring or infrastructure. But anyway, anything that plugs in the wall runs off of alternating current. It's much higher voltage. The electrons are technically going back and forth, oscillating, so to speak, in two directions. That gets a little complicated when talking about circuits. And what we want to do is just talk about circuits at their most basic level. So for our purposes in this class, we're going to focus our discussion of circuits on DC circuits. DC stands for direct current. Direct current. You can think of it for two ways. One thought behind direct current is the current is traveling in one direction only. There's no alternation. Current goes directly from one end of the battery, so to speak, to the other. The other is that DC is anything that runs off a battery. That's what I want you to know here. DC current circuits run off of a battery. Where the source of the current, so to speak, is directly there. It's right there, close to its source. This means our circuits are not, not short circuits in the sense of things are about to catch on fire, but our circuits are going to be much shorter and simpler to analyze and diagnose. So we're going to use DC, but anything that runs off a battery would be DC. Um, so, you know, flashlights, handheld fans, um, your car battery, right? Car runs off a battery at least to get started, and then once the engine's in motion, obviously it burns gasoline, unless you have one of those electric vehicles, uh, which is great for the environment, right? Um, because um, you plug them into the wall, which gets its electricity from, in most places, oh yeah, coal and oil and natural gas, which people say is bad for the environment. So anyway, now here in the area we're in, we get most of our power, let's do it on the Georgia side, from uh, hydroelectric dams. So um, Georgia power, at least where we are, relatively clean. Most of the country, though, right, it doesn't rely on wind, it doesn't rely on solar. Some places nuclear, that should, really should be expanded, but frankly, electric vehicles really aren't... Uh, anymore better for the environment because they're still pulling most of their cases, their electricity from uh, oil, gas, fossil fuels. Uh, but anyway, DC. AC, again, anything that plugs in the wall, my fan over there. Um, now your laptop, you say, it kind of uses both, right? It, the, the battery charges through alternating current, right? But then once I unplug it, the computer runs off of the DC, the direct current. So sometimes you get a little bit of an overlap there. Questions on the difference between AC and DC? All right. Now, as the circuit, that's, that's the pathway for current, right? So if I just have, for instance, a little battery, there is potential in that battery. There's what we call electrical potential difference. One end of the battery is positive, the other end is negative. You've noticed that when you've put batteries in things, you have the negative end, positive end. And the idea is that electrons are there. They are ready to flow. The negative side has plenty of electrons just waiting to get to the positive side. But the only way they can is if a pathway is created. That is, if you were to take a wire from one end of the battery and you were to connect it to the other end of the battery. I don't recommend doing that. But if you did, in that wire, electrons would start to flow from the negative end around to the positive side. Because that's what they naturally would want to do. But you have to provide that pathway. Now, does that accomplish anything? No. All it does is run the battery down, so to speak, okay? What you would want to do, ideally, then, is have one end of the battery, a wire going to something like a fan, a light bulb, I don't know, the starter of a vehicle, and then the other end back around again, so that as the current flows through the pathway, the current is utilized in some way. Does that make sense? Now, there's an idea that there's plenty of electrons in the battery just waiting to flow through, and that is technically true, but there's also a whole lot of electrons in the wire. 
and all they need is that electrical potential difference to start them moving, right? Electrons seeking positive, they kind of flow through the wire. There's another misconception that when the uh, power plant, right, is producing power, there's electricity just waiting in that wall circuit, and I plug in the fan, there's just electrons waiting to move, and as soon as I turn the switch, electrons race to the wire and they power the motor of the fan. Actually, there are already electrons there at the motor of the fan. All they need to do is start moving. And so the electrons in the motor of the fan start to move through the wire and back and forth alternating, but they just need a little push to get them moving. Really, truly, the electrons a mile away really aren't coming to my fan. It's the electrons that are already here in the wire of the fan, in the fan motor itself, that are just being pushed back and forth through alternating current. When you uh, turn on your flashlight, that switch, all it does is allow the electrons that are already there in the filament, if it's a incandescent or near the LED light, or perhaps a little bit in that wiring, those are the electrons that just sort of pass through. Now you leave it running long enough, sure, some of the electrons from the battery will end up going through there, but it actually moves very slowly. Electrons have the ability to move very, very quickly, right? We talked about this way back, we talked about electrons just whirling around the nucleus of the atom. They're there, they just need some impetus to cause them to leave the parent atom and go to the next one, or the next one, or the next one. And the ones that are already in the bulb of the light, so to speak, just need a little impetus to cause them to start moving. And as they move, light lights up. Does that make sense? So when, with this circuit, with this DC circuit, specifically what we're looking at, since again, it's one direction, the electrons just move from the negative toward the positive, it just needs a little bit of a push to get it there uh, because of something called resistance. Resistance. Resistance is that which impedes the flow of electrons. Resistance is simply that which impedes the flow of electrons. Again, an electron can whirl or whiz very, very quickly, but imagine a piece of copper wire. Well, there's a whole lot of delocalized electrons there, but imagine if you start to push those electrons along, they're going to bump into each other, aren't they? There's nuclei of atoms they may bump into, potentially. Um, there are electrons that aren't delocalized they're going to bump into. Right? Picture a hallway out here. Let's say fire drill, but it's not organized. Okay? We never practice. Okay? Second graders. Okay? And the alarm sounds, and we just yell everybody, run! Do little people have the ability to run fast? Not reasonably so. But what are little people going to do? they're going to bump into each other trying to get down the hallway. They're going to trip over each other. They're going to, there's resistance, right, that causes the potential of a, of a uh, little second grader or maybe even a high school senior who could run really fast, but there's people in the way. You weren't, didn't want to be late to class, but there were all those people standing around at lockers, like de non-delocalized electrons. Maybe there's larger people in the hallway, like nuclei of atoms. And there's stuff in your way. So is the case for electrons that are seeking to move through a wire. There's stuff in the way, so to speak. There is that which impedes their progress. So that as the book talked about, uh, and by the way, if you look this up, you'll get different numbers. The book uses 0 0.02 centimeters per second, which is uh, a fifth of a millimeter every second, which seems really slow. There are some places that say it's more like a micrometer per second. Other places say it's a millimeter per second. The point is it's really slow. They don't fly through the wire. They slowly advance, but there's already plenty of electrons there, so it's just a matter of keeping the electrons constantly flowing. As long as they're moving, you have current. Now, the more they move, right, the more they move, the more of them you move, then you get more current, you get brighter lights. Um, uh, tonight at the academic fair, you look at Adam's project, and he did some things with circuits where when you turn on the different switches, you notice, hey, these light bulbs are bright. Hey, these light bulbs are dim. Hey, these are kind of in the middle. And it was all in the way that he arranged his, his his circuits to produce more current to flow or less current to flow, all right? More resistance, less resistance. Resistance is that which impedes the flow of the electrons. So we've got this battery, we've got a DC circuit, we have electrons in the copper wiring, there's electrons in the light bulb, there's electrons in the battery. They just need that little push to start moving and there's resistance to them. In a wire, there are three factors that affect resistance. First of all, the length of the wire. First of all, we have the length of a wire. Consider for a moment 
the um, field day. Y'all remember field day when you were little? And you remember field day last year? Now, y'all were running all over the place because you were running field day last year. But the athletic events, you remember the, uh, the, uh, the sack race? You get the little dinky dudes, and they're all nicely spread out. But what happens when they start the sack race? They all kind of converge, and they start to bump into each other. Now, fortunately for everybody, the sack race is only 25 yards. Okay? At the end of 25 yards, we're done. Imagine if they had to keep hopping. Now, number one, they'd get tired. But there would just be more and more and more resistance the longer that race goes, right? Um, if we had really long hallways at the school, and we don't because we're a relatively small school, but if we had really long hallways, there would be that many more opportunities for you to be bumping into people trying to get along. The length of a wire increases resistivity as length increases. Length and resistance, rather, excuse me, are directly related, directly proportional. Thickness of the wire. Kendall, you actually did a project a few years ago, I remember, back when the academic firm was in Hodges Hall. And you did a uh, project on um, the different gauges of wire, the thicknesses of copper wire. And you found in your project that the thicker wire had more current, less resistance. Therefore, things, I think, was it light bulbs got brighter or something with the thicker wire? Why is this? Well, imagine we've got <laughs> legal minimum hallways, okay? Um, they're uh, seven and a half feet wide with foot and a half lockers, which allows six feet for walking. That is the minimum required by state building codes, okay? Imagine if you went to the school I went to and we have 12 foot wide hallways. Now we had to have 12 foot wide hallways because we had 500 kids instead of you know 40. But anyway, we had to have really big hallways. But imagine if we had bigger hallways and we didn't increase the population. We just had really wide hallways we'd be able to move much more easily, wouldn't you? In the same way, as you increase the thickness of a wire, the more technical term would be cross-sectional area. But practically speaking, you can think of the thickness of the wire. The thicker the wire, the easier it's going to be for electrons, those delocalized electrons, to flow through. There's just more space. Does that make sense? Finally, if you're in a hurry to get to class, and everybody else is also in a hurry to get to class, and you're all moving the same direction. Even a crowded hallway isn't too bad. The problem is when you feel like you're the only one who wants to get to class, and everybody else is trying to stand around and talk, right? If you feel like you're the only delocalized electron, and everybody else is localized, it's harder to get through. The more higher percentage of delocalized electrons, the easier it is for everybody to just kind of move together. Does that make sense? So the type of material, meaning how many delocalized electrons does it have, but the type of material is what makes the final difference. Things like silver and copper that have a much higher percentage of delocalized electrons are going to have less resistance. Metals like um, nichrome or even iron. Okay, they, their percentage of delocalized electrons is a little bit lower. They're still metals, okay, so they're still conductors, but their percentage is a little bit lower. They would have more. Silicon, very few delocalized electrons. There's going to be a great deal more resistance going through something like that. And of course, if nothing's delocalized, there's nothing to move anyway, right? So as far as your conductors, your insulators, your semiconductors, that's also going to play a part in the resistance in the wire. We can put this all in an equation this way. R, resistance in a wire, equals, and we're going to start with this Greek letter rho. Now, earlier in the year, we used it to represent density. Here, we're going to use it to represent resistivity. Resistivity is how you define the, the ability of the material to create resistance. Conductors have very low resistivities. They don't produce a lot of resistance. Some materials have very high resistivities. They produce a very high resistance. This is your type of material factors. That make sense? Okay. Um, then at times L, that's your length, and then over capital A, which is your cross-sectional area. So your resistivity times length over cross-sectional area. Now, I told you we're focusing on DC circuits. We're focusing on small circuits, not very long circuits. For instance, the wires that run through a bat through a flashlight, very short. Okay, very short wiring, very short circuits. Not, you know what I mean. All right. So resistivity is going to be measured in these units, ohms times centimeters, because resistance is measured in 
ohms represented by the Greek letter omega. You do need to know that, by the way. Put a star next to that. Ohms is our SI unit for resistance. Resistivity is going to be ohms times centimeters because we are going to measure the length of our circuits in centimeters for this class, and cross-sectional area will be in square centimeters. And there's your first equation for chapter 25. Resistance in a wire, R, is equal to the resistivity of the material times the length of the circuit divided by the cross-sectional area of the, or the length of the wire, divided by the cross-sectional area of that wire. You'll notice that the centimeters for the length and the centimeters for the resistivity together cancel with the centimeters squared for the cross-sectional area. Now, most wires, if you look at them, what shape is their cross-section? Take a piece of wire, you cut it, and you look at the end you just cut. What shape you got? Generally a tube, a circle, right? The cross-section is usually a circle. Wires are usually circular. So generally speaking, your cross-sectional area is going to be found pi r squared. Because you're generally working with a circular cross-section. It is possible, and they do make wires that rather than being circular in cross-section, are actually flattened down to something called a ribbon wire. Well, if it's ribbon wire, if it's a rectangle, you would use length times width. You'd multiply the two dimensions of the wire to get that cross-sectional area. So just make a note of those equations. Now, if you look at page 382 in your textbooks now, page 382, you see a table of different resistivities. You notice your conductors all have low resistivities, E negative sixes, very small numbers. Platinum's a little higher, E negative five. Mercury, which is a liquid stuff, anyway. Um, nichrome, E negative four. But these are all relatively low in the E negatives. You get to your semiconductors. Your semiconductors, they have uh, E values. Graphite is at least E negative. Germanium can be anywhere from a low E negative to a very small E positive. Silicon's a little higher, potentially. Boron, mm, higher still. But you look at your insulators. You got E double digits there. Okay, that's a whole lot of resistance. Electrons aren't getting through that. There's too much resistance to their flow. Okay, so we see the different resistivities there. You're going to use that table when you work problems, or I may give you those numbers on quizzes or tests. Look if you would across the page then at the example problem, example 25.1, and uh, read that for us if you would. Audrey. One All right, now half a millimeter radius would mean a one millimeter diameter. Uh, you know, use mechanical pencils. All right, you know, a lot of mechanical pencils say 0.7 on them. Does yours say 0.7 by any chance? Okay, 0.7 is one of the most common. I prefer 0.5 because I like a finer point. Though it, for achievement tests where we fill in in bubbles, I don't like the thinner lead. I like the thicker, the 0.7 or even the 0.9. I've even seen pencils with one millimeter thickness lead. Now, for lead, that's pretty thick for mechanical pencil lead, but that's all that's as thick as the wire is. Very, very thin wire, and it's a kilometer long, made of copper, which is low resistivity. The question is, how much resistance is in that wire? All right, so to solve the problem, we start with our equation class, R equals rho times L over A. Again, R equals rho times L over A. Now again, we're, we're great at doing this to you, where we put some proportionality constant, or in this case, it's proportional based on the type of material, at the beginning. We understand if it's at the beginning class, it really belongs in the numerator. So as we go to set this up, we're going to put our resistivity times the length all over whatever the cross-sectional area is. It says it's made of copper. Look across the page. What is the resistivity of copper? 1.7 E negative 6, and that's ohms times centimeters. What is the length of this wire according to the problem? One kilometer. But we have to have our length class measured in centimeters because the resistivity is given with centimeters. So we need to go from one, <coughs> that's a K, kilometer into some number of centimeters. Kilo, ooh, we haven't done this in a long time. Class kilo is E. Three centi is E negative two. All right, E three to E negative two. What's the change in the E value? 
It goes down five. That was down right. Good. Move the decimal to the right five places. And what does a one become with five places moved? 100,000 centimeters long. Okay? So uh, that's a little bit of an annoying thing. So your E values may come back into play here. And then finally, we have the cross sectional area. Well, what shape is the cross sectional area here? Clearly a circle, Kendall, right? Because it mentions a radius. How do I find the area of a circle class? Pi r squared. However, since the area needs to be centimeters squared, the radius better be centimeters also. And it ain't, it's millimeters. So I need to change 0 0.50 millimeters into centimeters. Milli is E, negative three, and we're going to E, negative two. The E value is going up one. Right? Make sure the y-axis, negative 3, negative 2 is going up 1. She up and left, left him. So uh, we're going to go to the left one more place to get 0 0.05 centimeters. That's the radius. So it's going to be pi times 0 0.05 squared. All right. So in the calculator, see how much resistance we have. 1.7 e negative 6 times 100,000 divided by pi. And then I'm also going to divide by 0 0.05 squared. And how much resistance is in this one kilometer long copper wire? Okay, round it off. Uh, was it two sig figs we get? 22. And our SI unit for resistance class is? Ohms. Sounds like a noise you make when you meditate. Ohm. Anyway, uh, 22 ohms approximately. That's a fair bit of resistance for a wire. Okay, 22 ohms is pretty high. However, it's a kilometer long. It makes sense you'd have a whole lot of resistance there. But what about, um, what about like a mag light? You know what a mag light is, the, the, the big you know, security guard flashlight, you know, crack skulls with that thing. Or on a uh, night at the museum, you know. Anyway, um, but not a museum too, technically, from it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, I digress. Um, Grace Christian Cole does not necessarily endorse the movie. All right, um, um, uh, so let's suppose we've got like, I don't know, like half a foot worth of wiring one way, half a foot. Let's say there's about one foot worth of wiring. A foot is about 30 centimeters. So let's change this number down to 30 centimeters. Now let's see how much resistance is in a smaller circuit that would actually use a battery. And uh, when we change up those numbers, what do we get for the resistance now? 0 0.00649, negligible resistance, barely anything, right? Uh, 0 0.0065 or 6.5 e negative 3 ohms of resistance, which is why as we work through our circuits, because we're focusing on DC circuits, we're going to ignore the resistance in the wire. We recognize it exists, but we also recognize for a DC circuit, resistance is so small, we're going to choose to ignore it it makes our math easier and we're lazy. It's like air resistance in our problems earlier. We know it's there, but if it doesn't have a huge effect, we're going to ignore it. We're glad it's there if we ever do parachuting or skydiving or something, right? But uh, in general, we don't walk through, man, it is so hard doing this endurance on this air resistance constantly slowing me down. No, you're just out of shape, like I'm one to talk. But anyway, <laughs> questions on this? All right. Um, now, you can use length, we can use this resistance to your advantage. For instance, this particular problem was using uh, copper wiring, right? But what if for some reason we wanted resistance? Now, I would still need to, need to use a conductor, probably, right? But uh, maybe I switch to nichrome, 1 e negative 4, right? And so maybe going with nichrome wire would uh, change things up a little bit now. That would um, that would almost give me, uh, go ahead and plug that in. I want to say it's somewhere around a full ohm of resistance. I may be wrong. 1 e negative 4 times 30 divided by pi and also divided by 0 0.05 squared. Yeah, almost half an ohm is what I'm getting. 
0.38, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So, so we're approaching an ohm's worth of resistance. Well, imagine, though, if you needed resistance. For instance, remember I talked about the light bulbs on Adam's project. He's got the dim bulbs, the, no, no pun intended. He's got the medium bright bulbs. He's got the really bright bulbs. Well, there are times you want dimmer bulbs, right? For instance, you know, maybe one day you have your own house and you're sitting there on a quiet evening and you don't want the bright lights. You want to kind of start to relax before you go to bed as you turn the lights down a little bit. Or maybe you have, you know, a nice little candelabra in the dining room and you prepare a romantic supper for your wife one day and you dim the lights a little bit because it adds mood and it's cheaper than buying candles because you can go through candles if you do it that way. I actually still do candles, like twice a year when I... I should probably do more. Anyway, um, <laughs> but there are times, where we're, for instance, down in our nursery, right, where we want the babies to sleep, okay? If they're playing, we'll have the lights on. If we want it quieter, we'll dim the lights a little bit. That way the workers can still see. And, of course, if they want it off, they can click it off. There's times you don't want the volume on your car radio all the way up. I know some people might find that shocking. You know who I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> Not people in this room. Uh, but there are people who park at a red light or stop at a red light not too far from your house not your house <laughs> there are no red lights near your house uh, but stop not far from your house at the red light at 11 o'clock at night who don't understand they can turn the volume down and when they turn the volume down you're decreasing the flow of electrons increased flow increased volume decreased flow decreased current how to do that? You increase the resistance. So there are times you want to be able to change resistance. A variable resistance is called, or a, a variable, a changeable resistor is called a rheostat. A rheostat. A rheostat is an adjustable resistance. And the book has a diagram of what some rheostats may look like. Not all of them work this way, of course. Uh, for instance, the, the volume control knob on your car, okay, uh, doesn't work this way. And, but a most basic rheostat would look something like this. And I like to picture a dimmer switch, okay? You have the current coming into the rheostat of where you see the input post there at the bottom of page 382. The current will flow through that resistance wire until it comes out, and you see where there's an output post that is not labeled at the far end of the rheostat? But there is this little contact, if you will, and that sliding contact touches the coiled resistance wire. The contact has lower resistance than the resistance wire. Let's face it, if you could choose between being stuck behind junior hires who are talking and taking a separate hallway, like my high school, we had a separate junior high hallway for all of them, and then there was all the other people got their own. And so we kind of, it was like purgatory down there. If you had to go through the junior high hallway, but you could cheat and go through the library to get to the other wing of the building, it was great, okay? You don't want to go through there. So given the choice, you'd rather go through, for instance, the aluminum contact rather than through the coiled nichrome wire, right? At the earliest opportunity, the current's going to flow up through the sliding contact points and through that output post. Well, if we slide the sliding contact, picture this now in your book, if we slide the sliding contact toward the left end, closer to where the current first comes in, the current doesn't have to flow through the wire very long before it can escape. It doesn't have a very long length of the current, of, of the wire, right? You're short in reducing the length of the wiring, reducing the length of the circuitry, thus reducing the resistance. Brighter lights. But as you slide the contact toward the far end of the post, of the coil, it has to go through more. More resistance is going to equal less current, dimmer lights. Does that make sense? And again, you can produce the same effect with the knob or even push buttons and that kind of thing. But that's the basic premise of a rheostat. And that's the basic premise of any time you're changing the lighting, the sound, anything that relies upon current in varying amounts. My fan over here, it's on low. I have more resistance. There's now less resistance by switching this, by clicking this. Now, what it may have been is I actually clicked to a different wire or a different pathway completely, but it's still, it's a shorter distance for the current to travel. Shorter still, increased current now. That's the premise of a rheostat. Does that make sense? Questions on rheostats?
All right, now then, let's get back to current and let's rewrite our definition for current as we dive into it in a little bit more depth. Current is that flow of charge. We had that in the last chapter, but let's get it down again. Current is the flow of charge. Again, it's the flow of these delocalized electrons. We measure current in a unit called amperes. We here in the United States are lazy. We usually just say amps. Same thing. Current measured in amperes. Now here's the deal. Because there is resistance in a wire, if I just held a random piece of copper wire, which I obviously don't have because if I did, I would have used it as the grounding wire. I did confess my sins to Miss Morse, by the way. She was not nearly as bothered as I was. Okay, she apparently had every confidence her, her, uh, her wire would hold up and not be zapped. Anyway, but if I held up a piece of wire, there are delocalized electrons. Are they going anywhere? No. Why not? Because even in a piece of copper wire, there is resistance. It's not much, but there is resistance there. What do you have to do? You have to give it some impetus. You have to give it some push to start the electrons moving. That's where you curl it around and touch it to the ends of the battery. Again, I don't recommend doing that, but there would be a push, right, to the electrons and they would begin to move. You need a little push to start current flowing. We call this little push, if you will, voltage. Voltage. The technical term, voltage, there's an L there. Okay, voltage. The technical term for voltage is its electrical potential difference. It's the difference between how positive something is, how negative something is. The greater the difference, the more rapidly electrons will tend to flow. Here's the way I like to think of it, though. Think of it as electrical force or electrical pressure. Okay, it's going to help us if we'll think of it this way. That's not technically its definition. That's how I want you to think of it. Voltage is like electrical force. It's what pushes the electrons along. You might occasionally have had reason to see parents with younger siblings, never with you, of course, but with younger siblings when it's time to leave the house. Come on, let's go, let's go, get the shoes on, they're right there. You know what I'm talking about. I that this morning. You had to do that this morning. Okay, um, so anyway, he's like, I had to be mom or dad or whatever you identify as, big brother, I'm just kidding. All right, so anyway, <laughs> there has to be a push to get things moving. The same is true with electrons in a circuit, in a wire. There's electrons there, they just need to start moving. And you get that push from voltage. That's what the battery provides. It provides voltage. It pushes the electrons so they'll start moving throughout the circuit. Realize this, the more of a push you give, the more electrons you can move. That makes pretty good sense, doesn't it? Right, if you line up a bunch of junior hires, like dominoes, and you push a little bit on the first junior hire, there might be a little bit of a ripple effect. I'm not actually, we don't actually do this here, okay, just in case you're wondering. We don't allow our seniors to bully the peasants and the scum of earth. Okay, we don't do that here. All right, so anyway, but if you push hard, you would move more of them, right? It's just fact of life, okay? More push, more stuff moves. Now, also, if they were little kids, second graders, less of a resistance to your push, the same amount of push would get a greater effect if they're smaller versus you had a bunch of big fat people and you tried to push a little bit, it wouldn't get nearly the effect, more resistance, if you will, right? So it makes sense then that current, the flow of charge measured in amperes, depends on the voltage, more voltage, more current, but inversely it depends on resistance. More resistance, less current gets through with the same amount of voltage. Does that make sense? That gives us our equation for current. Now, we think about current, current, you know where I'm going with this. What letter should we pick? See, it's measured in amperes, current, amperes. How about capital I? We've already even used it for rotational inertia. Whose bright idea was this? I don't know. I is the letter we're going to use to represent current, measured in amps. Which, by the way, amps are just represented A. Amperes just represented by the letter A, capital A. Current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. So the V is, of course, the voltage. And voltage is conveniently measured in volts, represented by V. That's not confusing either. V is voltage, V is volts. You measure V in V. That's the unit of V is V. All right, resistance is, me is the uh, resistance. We already specified it's measured in ohms. This one's not represented by, by a, a letter we use commonly. Well, you go Greek here, ohms. That's current. 
directly proportional to the voltage, inversely proportional to the resistance. Now, since that's true, we understand that if we just memorize one equation, we could extrapolate others, right? We've done this before. I don't want to memorize a whole bunch of equations if I can just rearrange letters. Think V equals lambda F, right? We didn't memorize it all different ways. We just memorized it one way. What if I wanted to solve this for the resistance? What would this look like if I got the R by itself? You don't need to mark in your book right now. What, if, what would it look like if I got the R by itself here? V over I. We would alternate the R and the I. What this means is that resistance determines how much voltage you need. More resistance requires more voltage to get the same amount of current. Or if you hold the voltage constant, you're going to get, you're going to get uh, less current with the resistance, right? So R equals V over I. That would be a way we could memorize it. Or if I wanted to solve it for the V. What would it look like if I got the V by itself? IR, or RI, we'll say V equals IR. This is the easiest way to memorize the equation. So we're going to memorize it for V equals IR. And this helps us to see this, that voltage is related to both things. Increased voltage gives increased current. Increased resistance requires increased voltage. Right? More voltage or more resistance, we need more voltage to get the current through. If you want more current, give it more voltage. And we see that voltage is directly related to both. I feel like that's the easiest way to memorize it, because now you're not memorizing something over something where you could possibly flip it. So V equals IR is the second equation. There's our first, and there's our second. Now, what if I wanted to produce even more current? I wanted current to flow unimpeded. I wanted to take that which was already a conductor. Is it possible to practically eliminate resistance? Theoretically, yes. If I could stop that vibrating nucleus from getting in the way, if I could stop those other electrons that are stuck where they are, the non-delocalized ones, if I could stop them from spinning so much, they stop getting in the way. In other words, have you seen the, um, I think it's a Discover Card commercial a year or two ago, they had the freeze it feature and you could freeze your card from your phone. And so there's this girl and she's at, you know, someplace where we probably shouldn't go. And uh, she's, um, she uh, is leaving with friends. It's like, oh no, where's my Discover Card? And she taps freeze and everybody around her just freezes. And so she walks through these people in awkward, like, frozen positions. Uh, did you ever play that game where you told people to freeze or something and everybody was, okay, freeze, and everybody's frozen, and she just walks through, finds her discovery card, picks it up, puts it back in her pocket, unfreezes the card, and everybody goes back to know what they're doing. If you could freeze the junior hires, right? I gotta get to class, freeze! Everybody stops because you're Grand High Royal Exalted Seniors, about to be graduates. And uh, then you walk down the hall, you just kind of work your way through, it'd be great. It's the fact that they're all moving around that makes it hard because it's unpredictable, right? How could I stop molecular and atomic movement? Absolute zero. If in theory I could get a conductive material, so it's got a lot of delocalized electrons, if I could lower its temperature near absolute zero, I would turn a conductor into something called a superconductor. Now, obviously, we haven't actually hit absolute zero yet. And you don't even have to stop the motion completely. Like, okay, Audrey, you're going to relate to this. Dead fish. They don't entirely stop their motion. But it's close enough to stop that you have moments of peace and tranquility, right? In the midst of what could have been chaos, perhaps. I don't know. Okay, I, I've never been in there to see Patch Club in motion. All right, I just imagine there's a lot of motion. All right, they've lowered the things down though near about four Kelvin, and they have seen a dramatic increase in current flow through the dramatic drop in resistance. So a superconductor is simply conductive material whose temperature has been super cooled, so to speak. Now on the flip side, on the flip side, Freezing something can increase current flow and decrease the voltage required. But what if you wanted to produce heat? 
We know this. If you're cold, you rub your arms. Friction produces heat, right? It's not maybe a perfect analogy, but as electrons collide and bump across other things, there's a little bit of friction produced. Well, imagine if I could pass a whole lot of electrons through a whole lot of resistance. A whole lot of resistance there, there's a whole lot of bump. That would produce heat, right? That's really what's happening with the light bulb, right? You ever touched a light bulb? Before? It was turned off, you didn't realize it hadn't been turned off very long, burned your fingers or something. Heat is produced when you can force a whole lot of current, a lot of electrons, through a whole lot of resistance using a whole lot of voltage. Now, there's two appliances in your house that produce a whole lot of heat. Eh, three, technically. The water heater produces one of them. Uh, but you don't usually see the plug on the water heater because it's, it's directly wired into the house. There are a couple devices you might have seen. Have you ever seen the plug for your oven, your range, stove, whatever you call it? Four prong, not three, right? As well as there's one other one that you've probably seen even more. The dryer. You ever notice the dryer? Typically nowadays four prong, not three. The reason is there's a whole lot more current coming in. That's not 120 volts, okay? That's much higher voltage because it's also forcing more current. Also, if you were to look at the, um, the uh, most houses don't have fuses anymore, but have you ever seen a circuit breaker panel in your house, right? And most of them are single switches, and you got a row of double switches. Twice as much current flowing through those, general, roughly speaking. Your dryer's one of them, your oven's one of them, your air conditioning is one of them, but that's just because it pulls a lot. Um, there's a couple more. I think the water heater's one of them. There's a fifth one in both houses, most houses. Anyway, you get the idea. The ones that are producing a whole lot of heat, two. Bigger plugs, why? More current, more resistance, using more voltage, okay? And that produces heat. So that's what I want you to know. Your formula to produce heat with electricity. To produce heat, you need high resistance and high current using high voltage. High resistance and high current using high voltage. That can produce heat. So temperature does have an effect, right? You can produce high temperatures, you can also uh, diminish the amount of resistance by supercooling. On the flip side, have you ever noted that certain devices like computers don't work as well if they get too hot? That's why they have a fan inside. Because as you increase resistance for the current, it increases heat. And as you increase the heat, it increases resistance. It could be a vicious cycle, right? Causing things to overheat. Okay, so um, that's kind of the relationship, if you will, between temperature and resistance or resistivity. Questions on that? All right, any questions on what we talked about today? A lot of stuff at you. A lot of this, have you heard a lot of this before? Was some of, a lot of this new? Where are we at? All heard a lot of it before? A lot of it just kind of make common sense based on things we've already observed, maybe around our house and stuff. Okay, uh, for homework, a little bit longer homework assignment tonight. Uh, sorry, reading pages 383 to 388. Reading over pages 383 to 388. On page 398, need you to answer questions 13, 15, and 18 through 22. Page 398, answer questions 13, 15, and 18 through 22. On page 398, need you to do problems 1 and 2. Page 398, do problems 1 and 2. So page 398, questions 13, 15, 18 through 22, and then on page 398 as well, the problems section, do just problems 1 and 2. All right, have a wonderful rest of your day, and you are dismissed.